Welcome to Crash Concepts, where the economy, energy, and the environment are explored. Up next, fresh ideas and insights into the factors that are driving the world and shaping your future. Presenting information you can't afford to live without, here's Chris Martinson. Welcome, everyone, to this Featured Voices podcast. I'm your host, Chris Martinson, and it is October 7th, 2019, today. We welcome to our program Charles Hugh Smith, a prolific author, operator of the excellent and very thought-provoking website of twominds.com. That's of twominds.com. Charles, hey, I consider him, he's a good friend and a regular guest of ours at Peak Prosperity, and we're going to be discussing his new book titled, Will You Be Richer or Poorer? Profit, Power, and AI in a Traumatized World. That's artificial intelligence. Now, look, you know my view. I say the world's at this massive turning point. Really, it is. And if you can't grasp the systems thinking or the dimensions of really what we're facing, it's going to be a really confusing ride. And even if you can, and I'm not sure anybody really can grasp what's happening here, it's still going to be a hell of a ride. Well, today we're going to do our best to make some sense of it all. And Charles Hugh Smith is really one of the very best in the game right now on that front. And I've really been looking forward to this podcast. So without further ado, let's welcome our guest to the program. Welcome, Charles. Thank you so much, Chris. Well, I uh, before we started recording, I was mentioning that your work has um, heavily influenced my thinking. And my goal in writing this book was to ask the question, what is truly wealth? And, um, and of course, the answer we all know is we, we – measure mostly in in financial terms like how much money are we worth and how much we're earning and so on but of course we we're aware at least at an intuitive level that there's a tremendous range of wealth that doesn't even get measured starting with the natural world wealth and social wealth and um societal wealth various forms of 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 infrastructure and culture that uh we really need to start measuring if we're going to navigate this um devolution degrowth era that you know we all know is coming well charles i love that you started the book there of course i think that these this is such a foundational moment in time that we've got to make sure we have our definitions right and it's my belief that what people call wealth really is cartoonish it's money and I love that you start out by by uh, going through the definition. So let's let's spend a little time here because I think this is important to set the stage. So when we talk about wealth, in your view, what's missing from the status quo definition of wealth? Okay, great question. And I think I started the book with a quote um, about um, the ease with which we um, make our definitions. In other words, we we measure what's easy. And so measuring money is really easy. And so is, you know, GDP and all this other stuff. What's really hard to measure so we don't bother or we 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 make a mess of it. We make uh, we make these kind of wild estimates that are really misleading is we don't really measure like the value of of the natural world to us as individuals or, you know, the human community or to our economy. And we don't really make any attempt to measure intangible capital. Like what is liberty worth in, in terms of your own agency as an individual? Like as opposed to, say, a person living in a very restrictive society where they really don't have a lot of wiggle room and, and say, compared to a freer economy and society like ours where – you know, if you decide to up and move, you don't need a government approval to move to another state. You can just up and move, right? I mean, that's there's some intangible value to that. And then there's cultural uh, values that are also forms of what I call intangible capital. So if you look at what we measure, which is the easy stuff, and then you look at what we uh, try to measure in a sort of, you know, misleading fashion – um, like we all know clean air and clean water are valuable, but we don't really put that into our uh, balance sheet, if you will. Um, and, then, and then all the stuff we don't even attempt to measure, which, which we call intangible capital. And so if you look at that, it sort of seems to me that we're, we're, we're talking about the iceberg. The financial wealth is the little bit above the water, and then the 80 to 90 percent of our real wealth is is below, and we're sort of – we sense it intuitively, but we don't really measure it. And without without an attempt to measure it, then how can we value it? 
Yeah, you get what you measure, of course, and I, I completely agree. So it's often presented, I feel, in the status quo framework that the money is the complete and total measure of the wealth because we've sort of assumed away all this other stuff. But, but let me make this very topical. Um, I, I And I love the way you frame this. So to me, I do value democracy, although I don't think it's actually practiced, but that's a different podcast for a different day. And I value freedom and all those sorts of things. So let's now let's wander across the pond for a second over to the UK, which has been running a massive ex experiment on um, nanny state, surveillance state kind of stuff. And what happened recently is there's a movement called Extinction Rebellion, which has said, hey, this natural world seems important and we're going to begin to protest uh, the status quo, which is the machine that wants more Paper wealth wants more GDP, and that's the entire machine. And they've said, we're going to, in very British, they're going to do it in a very polite way, but but maybe they'll block traffic or something, but they're going to begin to make their voices heard. And so what? how does the UK respond? Well, they just responded the other day by busting down the door, preemptively arresting uh, the leaders of this thing because they thought they were going to disrupt things in the future. So let's see what they just did. They uh, busted in without a warrant. They completely uh, took what you might call freedom and democracy rule of law threw those right under the bus because they thought there might be some sort of pushback or disruption to the to the to the wealth generating machine. So um, in your view, what you're just saying is that that in order to preserve the tip of the iceberg, the authorities in the UK were willing to literally bomb the bottom of the iceberg. The core foundational things such as liberty, justice, rule of law, all of that, they just threw that right under the bus. Uh, is that not maybe just a almost perfect metaphor for what you're talking about here? Yeah, absolutely. That it's a huge diminishment of the intangible capital of of personal agency and um, the rights that we supposedly have to dissent from you know um, the powers that be or or have a different point of view, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so we're, and so we're losing this intangible capital at like a, at a fantastic rate, which is why I titled my book in a traumatized world. I mean, it obviously, if you were in that group, put ourselves in, in the shoes of that group, it is extremely traumatizing to be, um, abused by a police state essentially, right. Where, where you realize you really don't have any rights, mm -hmm. you know? And so, and, and, and what's weird about the, the current structure, which, you know, um, we've talked about before is on the surface, we, we still have these legal rights, but in the functioning real world, they're dissipating, right? They're, they're diminishing. We really don't have these. It's, uh, and, and I think that's so true of, of, um, when we talk about like the, uh, value of community, meaning that there's a, there's a resilience, uh, built into the community because people know each other, they care about each other, they're willing to make sacrifices for other people, right? That structure is a, is an enormous source of intangible capital, right? And so when that dissipates and nobody knows anybody, nobody cares about anybody, and no one's going to sacrifice for anybody, you've lost an enormous amount of capital. And so never mind your, your, net, your net worth and money doubled, you're a much poorer person you know, uh, than, than you were when you had all this intangible capital. Well, and, and just to focus back on the UK, and of course, I'm not picking on them, we can do this uh, for any country right now. But um, it was only also in the last week that we saw a couple headlines come out talking about their intangible capital, they noted that hedgehogs, those cute little spiky things that that people have as pets sometimes, but they occur wildly in, in the UK, very beloved creature, they're down 95% in the past 40 years in terms of wild population and turtle doves uh, from the, you know, famous uh, uh, Christmas song, right? Turtle doves uh, down 95% uh, over the same time frame. So the natural capital is just absolutely shredding. We know that the UK has about 60 harvests left before their soil is completely degraded and useless for growing things on. So is it not true that the natural capital has, um, it's worth, it's worth perfect protecting and defending but more importantly, the sense of having a future, like what, what, what is so important that you have to preemptively arrest people who are saying time out, we think we need to rethink this, who might be saying we would like to leave to our, our children a world where there's an infinite number of harvests, not 60 left, right? Uh, to me, that, that sense of a future is the most important thing that's being diminished and stolen. And we're not even allowed to talk about it without being, um, 
ridiculed in some ways. And I was just interviewed, so was Adam, by BBC. And I felt that the, the interviewers were very ridiculing of this view of saying what I just said, which is, gosh, maybe we should think about the future, you know? And, uh, and, and so I get the sense that there's a machine out there that has, puts a zero value on anything other than money. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, um, if we want to describe capital, like let's define capital, capital is, you know, well, you know, capital is, is, is something which, um, you know, we, we, we want to accumulate capital. That's what wealth is, right? Capital is productive assets, right? And, and what we're, you and I are, are saying is the insects, the amphibians, the natural world, never mind the, the, the minerals we, we mine and the, the energy we extract in fossil fuels and so on. But the, the entire natural world is a, is a form of capital, right? And so if that's being diminished, you know, rapidly, then obviously we're losing capital. We're not accumulating capital. Accumulating capital would be increasing the sustainability of the natural world, right? And what we extract from it. So we're losing capital there. We're losing capital in terms of our um, civil liberties. And then and you mentioned the UK, and, and, and as you say, the same is true of the US. There's really two economies in the UK, and it's apparently extremely striking. Similar if you go to small towns that used to be industrial here in the States, and then they've, they've been emptied, and all that's left is um, what they call in the UK jumble shops, right? Like some, mm. some um, uh, you know, sort of secondhand stores, and the rest of the town is empty. And, and so um, I think part of what, what Brexit is about, as far as I can tell, is that the the ten percent that live well in London are the ones who, of course, control the UK society and economy and and media, and their life's peachy keen. Everything's great, right? The ninety percent left behind don't have a voice, you know. And as we're talking about, their voice is being restricted when they do raise that voice, right? And so the same is true of I think the entire industrialized world and even the developing world, right? That 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 there's a power structure that wants to maintain this sort of unsustainable, blindly destructive system because it's benefiting them, at least financially. And so we really have to talk about that power structure that's resisting what has to, what would be a, a more positive change for the, the whole of humanity. Yeah. And, and uh, this is something I think you talked about in, um, you had a prior book out, right? And it's the one right before this one, uh, the title, I don't have it right yeah. in my head, but uh, you you were really talking there about how the system as it is, um, oh, I, I just remembered it's pathfinding our destiny, right? Preventing right, the right. final fall of our democratic republic. In there, you, you opened with the idea, if, I, if I'm remembering this correctly, that the systems we're running, they're not just flawed, but actually they're designed to fail. So let's talk about that for a minute, because because to me, this gets to the heart of everything. If we're going to redefine wealth, redefine capital, and think about what's our role in how this unfolds, if you understand that this isn't a matter of tweaking the system because the system is actually designed to fail, well, then I think it's easier to step away from that and begin to step into the new. No, you're absolutely right. And and let's um, and, and uh, if we want to talk about systems and capital... I, uh, one of my topics is, will technology make us all richer? Because that's a huge part of, of the story, the growth story that, that, that you referred to already, is that we're, we're all promised, well, we're all going to get richer because robots and AI mm -hmm. are going to do all of our work and all these new fabulous technologies are going to generate energy you know, in, in, in super abundance and um, life's only going to get better for us. And so, uh, but when we start breaking that stuff down, then we start looking at, well, who's going to own all this, this fabulous technology, Google, mm -hmm. Facebook, <laughs> uh, you know, and, and so, um, and, and is it, it, how practical is it that we're going to, all these am amazing robots are going to come and do all of our work and that's going to make us richer. And if, and so I, I sort of break it down with a very simple example. You know, I, I'm like everybody in the peak prosperity community, you know, we, we all try to do things ourselves, right? We try to like fix stuff that's broken and, and 
learn more, and that's part of our resilience, right? So I've had to fix uh, dryers and, and washing machines. Well, what breaks? Well, sometimes it's a belt or something mechanical, but largely now it's the, it's the uh, circuit board, the, the so-called motherboard that controls all these appliances. Now, a, a, a dryer is a really simple machine. It's like a you know, steel drum that spins around. It's got a motor. That's pretty much it. And then it's got these this controls. Well, the controls have gotten fairly complicated. Now you got you used to have two or three cycles. Now you got 17, right, and so on and so forth. Well, these boards uh, cost about – 175 bucks. Well, on sale, that's you can buy a dryer for about double that, right? 350, 400 bucks. So you're talking about one part, which is a sealed plastic thing, you know, about 12 inches long, with I would say about five bucks worth of actual electronics on there. Because, mm -hmm. you know, there's an Omron chip. And, you know, if, if you know anything about electronics, you know that these are commodity chips, right? They're made in the millions. They're pretty simple. They're very cheap, like a dollar twenty each, maybe three bucks each. So and, and then a couple bucks for the circuit board, right? So, I mean, this whole thing is worth maybe 10 to 15 bucks. But it's sold to you by Sears or whomever for like 150 to 175 bucks. And then it's going to cost you another 175 to have somebody come and take the top off the appliance and put it in. And it's not that hard to do if you're familiar with stuff like that. But still, it's like, well, then, so what does the average person do? Well, they, they throw the dryer out, right? And they buy a new one. Because it's like, well, gosh, it's going to cost 350 to repair. I can buy a new one for 425 And so we have this landfill economy, which is, is part of what you're saying. It's a system designed to fail. In other words, it's a system that's designed to generate immense waste that, that can never be recovered. And so, and so I was just uh, asking – Look at everybody thinks these robots are going to work perfectly. They can't even make a dryer that functions for more than a few years before that motherboard fails. And how is a robot going to be any different? It's not. It's going to be part of the landfill economy. Yeah. Yeah, and and so this <laughs> this this whole narrative though is uh is based in and rooted in this thing which uh, and this I think is a really important point is that it takes time for human culture to sort of catch up with the reality of things. So this, this idea of a consumer culture, I believe, was born, say, in the mid-1700s and really got developed with the Industrial Revolution, and then it really sort of got perfected in the early 1900s, and we're still living by it as if it were true. And so what you're talking about, I've run into this personally, with a washing machine uh, where the that motherboard gave out, and I ran into that exact same idea, which was, mm, you know, am I going to just... Uh, succumb to the planned obsolescence of the corporation that designed that circuit board to break. And I resisted as hard as I could, replaced it myself. It's a painful process. I almost threw in the towel and just bought another one because it's just easier to, you know, chuck it and start over again. And, and, but that whole idea is rooted at, at its firmament level in the idea that there's plenty of resources. We can just keep doing that. Right. There's no larger cultural awareness that it's immoral to do something like that, that you should be ashamed as being part of Whirlpool to design something to do that because you just want to sell more units so that your CEO can make more money or whatever the story is. Right. It's rooted in this idea that we can keep being wasteful in this way. And as I wrote recently um, in that uh, in this in the, about how the Green Revolution is a bunch of junk, you know, I called it a bunch of hot air we don't have a lot of time to continue messing around in this story. And so you talk about how AI is coming along and the narrative that's being pushed at us is this idea that, ah, this robotics are going to come along. They can replace almost every job, but don't worry. You know, this will make our lives better, not worse. Um, you know, I think it was 1929, John Maynard Keynes had, it was a pretty famous lecture. He predicted that later generations would only work 15 hours a week, right? Because of advanced technology. He was right. We shouldn't be working more than 15 hours a week if we were sharing the abundance of all of that surplus energy. And we're not, of course. So human culture couldn't catch up to the technology to allow us to work 15 hour weeks or even to share that equitably. Um, your book centers on AI and robotics and all that stuff that's going to, you know, finally allow us to realize that dream of of hardly working at all. Your book seems to argue otherwise, and uh, and I think because maybe you're rooted in the idea that um, people are people. 
Right. And also, as you say, there's limits on the resources. Like uh, we, we just sort of uh, – I kind of I, uh, draw upon your recent piece about um, the amount of energy that we consume that's uh, you know fossil fuel-based and that the idea – you lead the reader through um, – the what what it would really take to replace all this and um it's a phenomenal uh kind of grounding and um for the peak prosperity audience it's called getting real about green energy in case you didn't it, it didn't, didn't get to read that one yet and i think the same can be said of lithium right and the same can be said of um of of all these rare earths and stuff all of which are essential components in in uh, you know, windmills and, um, <laughs> and solar panels and all this stuff. And so the same arguments that you explain for, for energy are also true of that. We, we would need to find planet lithium and it would have to drift close enough to us and that we could go out <laughs> and get all the lithium we need yeah. to replace, <laughs> you know, there's just not, it's just not feasible. And the, the, uh, again, uh, talking about capital, if we, we're, we're, um, we're a rich society, right? So we do all of the uh, stripping of capital and the destruction of capital elsewhere. So if you happen to live next to a lithium mine, right, and your water was poisoned, you know, and um, all, all the degradation that comes from digging gigantic holes to extract a few thousand pounds of, of rare metals, then you'd have a different idea about whether lithium batteries were going to save us, you know. And, um, and so you mentioned that we're even running out of sand. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I you know, you got to laugh, right? <laughs> what are you going to yeah, do? <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, the whole idea that we're going to create 5 billion robots, right? All of which are going to work perfectly and never break down and, um, and that are going to be super easy to repair and that we're going to just dig up all of the minerals and resources needed to make these 5 billion robots. And then we're going to throw them out because they're all going to break. And we're so they'll go in the landfill and we'll make another 5 billion. And, and, and it's, and it's kind of like you, you talk about the green deal and all that stuff. It's like, well, so you know what the green deal is, is we're going to take all four or 500 million uh, petroleum-powered vehicles on Earth, uh, and maybe it's more than that, right? It might be 600 million. And we're going to throw them all in the, in the landfill, never mind recycling. They're, they're not that easy to recycle, folks, and that's why China gave up. <laughs> Don't send us any more junk to recycle. It's expensive, mm -hmm. and it's not, doesn't, it doesn't pay financially. So we're going to throw out 600 million vehicles, and we're going to build 600 million new ones that are all electric, and that's going to solve everything. And then what happens when those things die in five to ten years, right? Because you've got to replace the batteries. Oh, well, then we're going to throw those 600 million away and build 600 more. <laughs> and it's all, you know, in other words, we're just not grasping that there's limits and that, that the destruction of the world in order to try to keep this narrative going, we're actually poorer every day. Never mind what our balance sheet says. We're, we're, we're all getting poorer. Well, there's a, a sense here, you know, that, that I share with you that I think increasingly people are sharing, um, it, look, something's wrong. And we see the, the protests in Hong Kong. We see the yellow vests in France. We see Extinction Rebellion really popping up all over the world right now. Um, we see what, uh, you know, the nerve that Greta Thunberg touched, right, and really caused a lot of people to lose their minds. Um, because, of course, you know, she touched on a belief system which evoked strong emotions in them. I, I saw very few people, as a quick aside, Charles, uh, take uh, Greta's arguments and, and, and be logical or, or fact-based about them. I saw a lot of people get very emotionally upset that this 16-year-old was daring to say something along the lines of, y'all have messed this up and we might hold you accountable for that, which is a, a no-no in today's world. Can't get held accountable for anything, yeah, unless you're a little person, right? And, and so, but this is a conversation we need to have because I think you, you framed it well. I'm going to quote from your book here. You said, quote, the belief in the ultimate goodness and inevitability of technological advances is often presented as a binary choice. One either believes that technology will eventually solve every human problem or one is anti-technology and therefore anti-progress, suggesting there are limits on technology is thus heretical. For believers, there are no limits. 
Let's set aside the false binary choice and ask, are there intrinsic limits to technology? And if so, are we approaching any of these limits? End quote. I like this because um, obviously, you know, we can get technical and talk about the limits and all this and that, but it actually gets to that it's more of a belief system involved that some people really want to believe that technology allows us to keep moving forward. We don't have to look at any of the consequences of that. If there are any things that happened in the past because of technology, but we'll just, we'll just skate right through them. You know, we'll just move so quickly that, um, uh, we'll, we'll get right past them. You know, I guess this would be the Peter Diamandis, uh, singularity, you know, we'll, we'll create technology that will never allow it. We'll never have to die. Right. Um, you know, we'll get to this magic moment of singularity of, of, uh, human technological nirvana. And then there's the other side which says, mm, nah, every problem we're trying to solve right now was created by a past technology. So Joseph Tainter limits, limits to complexity. Eventually that all catches up with you. That to me feels like the narrative war that's really playing out. And that's why I wanted to quote that piece. And I, I want to talk about that because I think this is more of a psychological problem than a technological problem right now. Yeah, I think you've absolutely nailed it is that it's, um, it's a form of religion or, or faith based mm -hmm. uh, that if you if you say, well, I'm not I don't believe in technology is going to solve, like, say, the decaying social and cultural capital. In other words, the, the fact that our social and cultural capital is in uh, basically a collapse. Right. right. And, and I don't think technology can solve that that loss of, of intangible capital, then you're branded as, um, you know, anti-progress, Luddite, et cetera. And, um, and so then there, the conversation ends right there. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. The, um, another, uh, thing I brought up in the book is, um, an idea I borrowed from a financial analyst, uh, who's one of my readers, Simon's chase. It's called negative network effects. And this is, um, you know, the, the, uh, the network effect is the idea that um, when everybody starts using something, then it becomes more valuable as a system, but also it becomes more valuable to each person. So, you know, the Internet is the classic example. We all start um, using it and we start, wow, we, get, uh, we can access all this information. Our lives get, you know, richer information wise and, and yet the system itself grows because we're all contributing to it as well. Well, uh, the, the idea of a negative network effect is is what we see in platforms and um, monopolies. Like when everybody joins a system and then it's controlled by a, an elite or a platform or a corporation at the top, then they can use that system to benefit themselves and everybody else is losing capital or, you know, we're all getting diminished by being part of this. And I think um, that's a big concept because it, it plays out in social media, you know, that that we're told we're all benefiting from the craziness that social media is when in actual fact we're getting lonelier. We're having all these mental health issues from being addicted to social media. We're feeling um, diminished because we're not um, sending photos to everybody from Sri Lanka or, you know, whatever. Um, you know, somebody's always better than we are, you know. Um, and then we see it in healthcare, you know, and, and um, again, we, we, we can refer to the UK and, and their struggles with their national healthcare system and our complete um, mess of a, of a kind of quasi public private healthcare system, the worst on the planet um, in terms of waste and, and uh, poor outcomes. It's like we're all part of this system. We don't really have a lot of options out. You know, it's like the, the, the healthcare system is, you know, you got three insurers or, you know, and that's it. And you don't and they all act the same. So it's like a cartel or a monopoly. And we're sort of trapped in these huge systems which extract wealth from us you know, financial wealth and make us poorer in terms of things like health, mental health, um, agency. We're, we're getting poorer because we're trapped in these negative uh, system effects. And, and, it's, and, and if you look at health, let's say we, we want to look at health as a, as a kind of a manifestation of all these things we're talking about. We all know that we're getting unhealthier as a society, right? And, and, I mean, we're really descending uh, – quickly, if you will. And it's all like, why? And you go, well, it's, it's money, right? People selling 
highly processed food are making billions and then the people making the drugs to counteract the highly processed foods effects on us are making billions and so on. And it's all like, wow, this is a really sick system because it's, it's, it's financially rewarding for the few that own these things, these systems um, and platforms, but it's actually impoverishing the rest of us. Well, a number of examples come to mind, and we're seeing, I think it's being swept well under the rug at this point in time, the, the fact that a lot of the opioid manufacturers and pharma companies, including the Sackler family, who are pure evil, yeah. by the way, uh, yeah. you know, because they knowingly were getting people addicted because it padded their bottom lines and, and made them personally richer, knowing they were destroying lives all the way to the point of deaths. And so that that's pretty egregious, right? And you know, if 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 we get a full measure of justice in the United States over that, they'll have to cough up a few of their profits back. You know, ouch. Uh, you know, and meanwhile, you get the you know the little people find themselves in debtor prison again. Increasingly, we find people in prison because they couldn't pay fines, warrants, uh, other outstanding things. Uh, many cases, you know, they they were treated as like walking ATMs, which we learned after the Ferguson riots and the justice department came in and said wow a town of twenty thousand people with sixteen thousand outstanding warrants that's that's kind of weird you know um and uh so so that cultural capital is getting shredded and and it's all in the service of making money and a few bucks and i think we're going to discover in this story that that maybe money isn't everything right that actually having that social and cultural capital is a really important thing when the chips are down and increasingly, I think that's what we're seeing is the people understand that the chips are about to go down and land on the table. Uh, and, and so my own, you know, personal example of this technology being a two edged sword and, and where I think it's culturally reducing us. I'll tell you what. I love YouTube. I love the instructional videos. I've learned so much. You want to learn anything? I, I just learned how to make a, 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 a fire operated desal plant. Wonderful. Right. Uh, I've also lost the ability to experiment and find things out on my own, you know? Um, and so at this recent meeting I had at my house where some people got together and said, hey, should we actually think about forming a community of, at some point? A big fear people came up with was, hey, if the internet goes away, I don't know how to do anything anymore, and that worries me, right? Um, and and I, I think it's a legitimate fear. Yeah, that's, that's a great... Um... That's a great example of a form of intangible capital, which, you know, in other words, this is what is so um, interesting to me is, is there are so many forms of intangible capital that we take for granted, one of which is our ability to figure stuff out. And if we become dependent on, you know, on the Internet to tell us how to do everything, we've lost another form of capital. But I want to move on to my last couple sections, which were called what the titles are. Um, you know, finding new relationships between capital, labor, and the natural world, right? Because, because if we focus on short-term profits, mm -hmm. and then we, and then we, we all have this perverse incentive where, well, we have to, we have to work to make money to, to have a livelihood, and so we're embedded in this system that exploits the natural world and and uh, reduces the the total capital available to humanity all in service of a power structure, you know, at the top. And then the rest of us are kind of stuck there trying to make a living. And so we need, we need to make a new set of relationships with much better incentives. Right. And if you're going to focus only on short-term profits and financial capital, well, that we're already doomed, right? Because all those incentives are perverse. So then my next section is where will your capital flourish? And, and, and I think this is where I'm really interested in what you personally are trying to do, which is to establish a community where people's own capital, you know, tangible and intangible, their skills, their experience, their drive, their cultural values, where it can flourish. And that's what we're really lacking as a society and economy. There's just so few places where your capital can flourish. So let's talk about how do we, how do we make, find a place or make a place where our capital can flourish. Well, let's talk about that. Of course, very near and dear to my heart at this point, because, you know, I've, I've been at this 10 years, uh, 11. And by this, I mean, you know, trying to use logic and words and reason to to nudge people towards uh, a conclusion, which is happens to be how I see the world. But it's just math at this point that says, you know, can't continue as is. But more to the point, and I think what you're raising very importantly in this book is as well as maybe it's not 
It's not that it can't be preserved, but maybe we shouldn't even want to preserve it in its current form because it's not life affirming and it's not in, in every measure of the word life affirming for humans and non-humans. And, but there's a really another way, isn't there? Um, where your capital can, and this is a full spectrum view of wealth and a full spectrum view of capital where, where it can flourish. Like this is what's, that's what I like about, about section seven in your book, asking where capital can flourish. Cause what you're really asking, nudging people towards the conclusion is like, you know what? Not only should we do better, but we we kind of we can, you know. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And it and to start I'm kind of asking people to make a different balance sheet for yourself uh, and your household. Like we'll start adding up what you what you do have in capital that you might not have even recognized as capital and and what's diminishing. You know, in other words, what capital are you losing in your current lifestyle? And and so um, if you have a three and a half hour commute to get to a job you hate um, because you're trying to pay your mortgage, um, is that are you are you really getting richer? You know, I mean, you're, you're hoping your house will double or triple in value, but what are you losing in the prospect? And so, mm -hmm. and, and how else could we live where we're, if we measure all the forms of capital that we have, if we include the balance sheet of our access to um, stability, to trust, to integrity, to natural beauty, right? To a sense of security um, and safety. I mean, those are the things humans intuitively value, right? Um, and so how do we get there? And it's like, well, we're obviously going to have to uh, pry ourselves out of the, uh, the matrix to some degree. And we also have to make a living in a, in a system built around failure and perverse incentives. But what else, how can we do this where we're going to be in control of our capital? And I think that's really a large part of my message is, look, at, we're going to have to take control of our capital to, to change things. And so if you're working for a corporation that's headquartered 5,000 miles away, using um, resources from 5,000 miles away, eating food from 10,000 miles away, and, 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 and basically indentured to banks you know, 15,000 miles away, you're not really free, right? You're really trapped in a system that's um, destructive to you personally, as well as to the planet. So how do we break out of this? Well, it's not easy, right? <laughs> no, it's not it's easy. Not. Uh, but there are ways we can we can improve it. We can move the needle and, and toward those goals. Well, let's talk about that because this is uh, obviously I, I think the uh, obviously near and dear to my heart. But but it's it's the it's the direction we have to go. It becomes as simple as saying we have to become the change we wish to see. But you you raise something really important, which is that first step is really hard because it's not like there's baby steps you take away from this system of command, control, slavery, destruction, all that stuff. Um, you know, as if Mammon came to Earth and and uh, was was allowed to run unfettered across the cultural landscape. So here we are. Uh, it's very hard to take that first step. What do you What do you have as advice for people? Uh, and I see some of it here in your book. Um, but I'd like to talk about how how to how does somebody go about you know stepping away from that, knowing that that first step is really difficult, especially if you have that mortgage and kids in school and car payments and all the rest. Right. Well, I think uh, my my premise here is if we if we each take a balance sheet and, and start listing what's really important to us in, in terms of our capital or our access to capital. Right. And so if, um, if if say, for instance, if you decide, you know, I can tolerate a BS job that's totally inauthentic, you know, because I, I, I'm, I'm able to make a lot of money. But I, I realize you might – somebody might realize, you know what? I really need access to natural beauty. I, I really am sick and tired of, of, of living in a concrete jungle mm -hmm. um, and, and urban grime. I've got to, I've got to figure out some way to, to have access to natural beauty, for instance. And I also am – and so you, you by listing all the kinds of capital that and, – and, and prioritizing it, like what's really important to me? You know, then then you can say, OK, now with those prioritized forms of capital, I can I can then start 
thinking about what situation would give me more of the capital that I want and value and less of, of the capital that I'm getting, but I don't value. Right. Um, and so, uh, in a lot of, in a lot of cases, it doesn't require moving from a particular place, but it, it may require moving to a different profession or, or completely gutting your expense structure so that you can you can afford to make some change, you know, mm -hmm. um, or it may require moving. And, and you know, I look at at um, at at, uh, at the people I know and 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 just kind of reading headlines. It looks like America is on the move. A lot of people are moving out of places where they no longer feel safe, they no longer feel secure, they feel like a tax donkey or, you know, a debt surf. And and they're moving to smaller communities. And so places, um, you know, the fastest growing cities in America tend to be small, you know, that that people are glomming onto these places going, wow, this life is actually much better here, you know, and hey, it's pretty here. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. And so, and, and it it's wrenching to think about moving physically, you know, but on the other hand, if you've prioritized what's important to you in terms of, of all the capital that you own or have access to, then, then, then you're able to generate this psychological motivation to do it. In other words, if you say, you know what, my skill set, I'm not even using my skills. I'm trapped in this stupid job and I'm, I'm stuck here because it, it's paying me, but, but I want to go out there and use all my skills. Well, you're going to have to take some risks to do it. But if it's really what's important to you, you know, your internal capital, then you'll find the wherewithal to make it happen. That, that's my own personal experience. Now, um, you know, the, the powers that be are, are doing everything they can to convince people not to do that. You know, um, they'd like the tax donkeys to stay where they are. They've been jamming the markets relentlessly. Uh, and so, you know, a lot of people are, are maybe thinking, gosh, you know, it doesn't. On the one hand, it feels kind of urgent. I get what you're saying. On the other hand, yeah, it's a big step to take. And, and there are a lot of signs out there saying, don't worry, you know, be happy, you know, look at, you know, stock markets within a couple percent of all time highs and maybe powering like it wants to go higher. Um, to me, I think that uh, the media has been misleading us badly. I think the stock markets are just a signaling device of the government at this point in time and its cronies. Um, you know, hard to draw that line where the government starts, stops and where Wall Street begins, ends. But, uh, you know, I, I think that all of these things are, are actually terribly misleading to people and that what you're asking people to do is to take stock of their own situation, add up their own balance sheet for themselves, decide what's important, what's not important, because truthfully, what the media is busy telling us is important is actually not only not important, but anti-important in the sense that I think is leading us astray. W would you agree with that? And, and, and you know, do you think there's uh, what 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 percentage chance would you put on this all sort of resolving itself peacefully? <laughs> Yeah, Chris, you know, it's like I've written, um, in fact, I, I've written for Peak Prosperity a number of pieces on, you know, these big, long uh, dynamics of, of cycles, you know, where there's not just economic cycles of the business cycle or whatever, but there's social cycles where people find fewer reasons to cooperate with each other and societies fragment and then you, you get um, – and they often are associated with, with inflation or high unemployment or a decay of the real economy, right? Resources mm -hmm. become scarce and expensive and so on. Well, we're clearly in that a cycle that is, is only beginning, right? And you can uh, – there's lots of cycles that we can talk about, the Kondratiev or the, um, the fourth turning – or you know the long cycles of Peter Turchin, it, it, we're clearly in that cycle, and so things are not going to resolve themselves quickly. There's going to be a reset or a reckoning, right, where we're going to have to um, downsize uh, and and live within our means and 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 find some new social structures that that um, are sustainable, right? Because the unsustainable ends, and and that's that's the phase we're in. And, it, and as you said, it's it's not just a physical, um, material world adjustment where we have to use less energy and, and fewer resources. We also have a psychological change that this is not something bad and awful, you know, that, that it's actually a positive change, right, if we embrace it. And so um, I think just starting to try to calculate 
the value of all the capital that we don't measure is is a very uh, powerful first step because just just realizing that you have all these forms of intangible capital that 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 no one taught us to to measure or even recognize um, that's a very powerful I think uh, process psychologically and it's a form of if you start trying to prioritize what what forms of capital are important to you it's a form of sort of psychoanalysis if you will because you really have to dig down into yourself and go gosh you know um what really is important to me and what forms of capital do i have that i can invest in in another way of living another livelihood another form of community you know and 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 um one of my little sections here is called trade-offs risk and return and of course what i'm trying to do is be practical about it you know and um that there's always trade-offs. You're, you're not going to be able to, you know, uh, get rich speculating in the stock and bond markets and, you know, run a farm and build a community. And, you know, it's just like, sorry, there's going to be trade-offs. You're going to have to give stuff up. You're going to have to sacrifice some things in order to get what you what's really uh, fulfilling to you. Yep. And uh, and that that's 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 wrenching in and of itself. And people tend to wait until bad things happen, and then they then they realize there's the trade offs have been imposed on them. Like they eat a highly processed food diet, and they have a heart attack, you know. And then they suddenly realize, wow, you know, I'm going to die if I don't change. And and or you get fired from your job when your corporation you know gets rid of your entire division. Then you're forced to look at a different lifestyle and a different livelihood. But we really do have the power to make those changes before catastrophe strikes. And, and um, that's kind of what I'm, I'm trying to end the book on a positive message that I think this is entirely possible for everybody. E, e, you know, you may not be able to revolutionize your life in one fell swoop, but you can certainly make progress toward, towards what's important and be, you know, building and accumulating the capital that actually is meaningful to you. Well, thank you for that. And I, I do, um, to close this up, I, I do think there's a generational piece coming up where a lot of the younger people, you know, we saw those mass, uh, I don't even know if I could call it protests, but anyway, mass gatherings of, of people around, they were huge, by the way, 350,000 people in Montreal. I mean, it's just massive, right? Um, yeah. It, coming out and saying, we don't like what's happening to the natural capital in this story. We want to do things differently. Uh, I thought it was heavily minimized in the press, which wants us to believe that we're only two China trade headlines away from lasting nirvana in the stock market, right? Because, uh, uh, you know, we we really, really, really have a terribly, terribly misleading um, set of people per trying to preserve the status quo. But generationally, we have young people coming out saying, I don't see it. I don't see that story. You can take your planned obsolescence and your, you know, dying on on a schedule, washing machines and shove them. You can take, you know, your lack of action on meaningful action on anything, you know, climate related and shove it. Uh, you can take your destruction in the natural world and shove it. And and so I think this is already afoot. Um, and I love seeing the number of young people who who at least are able to articulate the most important two words I know, which are not this. Right. And we saw again to bring back Greta Thunberg was was for people who did level some sort of a charge against her. Some of them said, yeah, well, what's her answer? Right. Well, if we're facing a predicament, there is no answer. Right. And so at least sometimes you start with not this. And so uh, what I love in your book, you know, will you be richer, poor profit, power and AI in a traumatized world? Charles, it's all about um, taking stock for yourself, what matters, what doesn't matter, but really noting that there is the other side of this story that is never talked about in our press, which is that all of the technology that we think we love is, is great, but it has a cost. And once we really begin to add those costs up, we find that on balance, things are starting to become subtractive, not additive. That's what I think is fueling uh, a lot of the popular protests around the world. That's why I think they're so desperately trying to uh, keep the markets elevated because they, whoever they are, can't allow the conversation to even get started, you know, about what's happening here. But it's happening anyway. And so uh, I think we need to have this story told in many, many, many different ways. Uh, lots of teachers, lots of lots of different ways of looking at it. So um, your book, Will You Be Richer or Poorer? Profit, Power and AI in a Traumatized World. Charles, how do people get your book? 
Well, sadly, um, because I'm self-published, it's available through Amazon, ah. <laughs> one of the platforms. Um, and um, I, I am keeping it at a 15% discount okay. uh, uh, for the next uh, few days after this program runs. So, um, And I'll, I will post a free uh, section of it on my website of twominds.com where you can read the first, you know, couple chapters and and see if you um if you're going to get any value out of it but i i i do feel we're all getting poorer but th there is an upside to degrowth you know if we learn to use less of everything we can have a much more fulfilling life and and uh giving and sacrificing all the bad stuff is not really detracting from us we're actually accumulating all forms uh, all these other kinds of capital that we're not even measuring by by entering a, a degrowth and embracing degrowth instead of going oh how awful you know um, we're going to use less of everything yeah well very well said and, and uh i really enjoyed reading through this book in preparation for this interview and i hope other people will uh, take advantage of the 15 percent uh, discount and uh, get the book and read it because we really need to start talking about these issues. So thank you for taking the time for this interview. Thank you for writing the book. Uh, appreciate it. Thank you so much, Chris. I was uh, thrilled to be able to talk about it with somebody that understands it. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And and uh, as soon as I stop recording, we'll probably keep talking about it. And people, you should join the conversation. So uh, come on by. Uh, if you're listening to this on YouTube, come to Peak Prosperity and join the comments uh, beneath. I'm sure Charles will be weighing in. We'll be talking about this for a while. And with that, I'm signing off, Charles. Thank you for your time today. Thank you, Chris. <laughs>